Ladies and gentlemen of the video, welcome to our video of an audio podcast, which is Howard fast Stern becoming show. a video podcast. Except by... See, now here's the thing. Roger, how would you feel? And I'm curious how people watching would feel if we started the stream earlier, but then in the video that gets posted, cut off the pre-show so it starts right at the beginning of the show. It would be more work, though. It would be more work, but I thought we would try that with the audio, too, and people wanted the, the lead up to it. I know they wanted the post. We tried cutting off the end, and they didn't like that. As a viewer, I like watching the pre and post show both. Okay. All right. There's a there's a there's a voyeuristic feel about being able to be like that's behind the scenes. Yeah. yeah. It's like All when right. Katie Kirk used to yell at the producer and stuff. Oh yeah, you get me yelling at Roger about the day. <laughs> you know, so, you know, back in the day when, you know, a lot of feeds are still done by satellite truck. Uh, and you had a satellite receiver, you're essentially stealing cable. You could get, they would send the feed, but they wouldn't make it live on broadcast yet. Right. So you, if you had a satellite dish, oh, you, yeah, you could watch receiver, all that stuff. You could watch cool. all that stuff. This guy recorded everything. And there was one is where Kitty Kirk was just getting mad at everyone <laughs> right before the show started. <laughs> like, that's what people want because they think they're looking behind the yeah, uh, that's good curtain. All right. Well, let us know. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com or in the YouTube comments, I suppose. But meanwhile, we're going to do a show. You ready? Yo! Let's show it up in here. I'm ready. Here we go. This episode of the Daily Tech News Show is brought to you by me. If you'd like to bring the next episode to yourself, go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support to be part of the show. Let's do this, Tom. <laughs> This is oh, the Daily Tech News for Friday, April 22nd, 2016. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, uh, Shannon Morse, host of Tech Thing, producer at Hack5, uh, and just awesome person. How's it going, Shannon? You know, I think you are an awesome person, too. Aww. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you for being here. <laughs> it's uh, it's good to have you. Darren is out and about, but we still have Hack5 representation. It's awesome. Yay! Yeah, so Darren actually just got back with my lunch. <laughs> I made him go out and get lunch for me so I could do the show. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I didn't realize that. Uh, will he bring you yeah, coffee yeah. later? Go too? get me food. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, also, uh, not with us today is Len Peralta. He may actually be in Los Angeles by now. He is flying here for a uh, conference, but he was going to be in transit, so he couldn't join us, which is sad. Oh, we're um, missing out. Yeah, I know. Sorry about that. We'll have you back again on a Friday when Len is actually here. For All sure. right, cool. <laughs> uh, but we're we're going to talk a little bit about the idea, what tech is doing, what startups are doing to the idea of the independent contractor in light of an Uber settlement, which we'll tell you about in a little bit later today. And also, uh, Shannon and I both discovered like you really should be tipping your Uber driver. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> yeah, which uh, the Uber drivers themselves had been telling us, no, it's a complicated thing. We'll get into that in a little bit, why they were supposed to tell you that, even if they didn't want to. But let's start off with the headlines. <laughs> oh, that's the wrong button. Apple's iBook store and iTunes movies are no longer accessible in China. Sources told the New York Times that China's State Administration of Press, Publication, Radio, Film, and Television told Apple to halt the service. An Apple spokesperson in Beijing said, quote, We hope to make books and movies available again to our customers in China as soon as possible. Now, you, you use an iPod. Do you use iBooks or iTunes? I do not use an iPod. <laughs> I use an iPhone. A uh, pad. That's what right. I mean. <laughs> oh, I use an iPad, yeah. I don't. I've never used iBooks. I've always preferred Kindle uh, mm -hmm. because if I'm not on an iPad, if I'm on my Android device, I can still read my Kindle books. Can't read my iBooks over there. Same thing with iTunes. Uh, I jumped out of Apple Music after the trial period, uh, and I prefer using Google Music because, again, I can get Google same. Music on all my devices. So Yeah, I'm the same way. Well, I don't know how popular it is over in China, but I hope they get it back. Yeah, I, I think, well, it's obviously something that Apple wants to make popular, even if it isn't that popular yet, and they're not going to be able to do it if they can't sell it at all. Um, so right. yeah, regulations came into effect to prohibit foreign ownership and joint ventures in online publishing. So I imagine that's probably the reason, at least that's what Reuters is suggesting, uh, and it would make sense that they would have to figure out how to make sure they aren't falling afoul of those rules and saying, we're not actually being a publisher, we're just a store. 
Microsoft told Recode's Ina Freed it has agreed to, quote, withdraw its regulatory complaints against Google. And Google gave a similar statement saying it also will withdraw its regulatory complaints against Microsoft. Both of these all around the world. Microsoft has left Fair Search and iComp. Those are two of the groups that are supporting antitrust action against Google in Europe. Microsoft dropped its patent litigation against Google last September. Uh, why all of this friendship between Google and Microsoft? Well, Ina Fried notes that Google Sundar Pichai and Microsoft Satya Nadella have a different relationship than Eric Schmidt and Steve Ballmer probably did. So surprise, they actually like to go out to the bar together. Do they? Right? I don't I mean, know. <laughs> I would imagine they would. Uh, they, they certainly have more similar approaches in, in some ways, a, a more friendlier approach. And, and forgetting their personalities, the Microsoft uh, strategy is to make their software available across platform. And that's a whole lot easier to do if you're friends with Google on Android than Which it is if you're doing very well heads. in the, the past year or so. They've been doing very well with getting their the operating systems out onto various different kinds of environments. So it's good to see some agreements there. Yeah. Uh, w. Scottis One asks a very pertinent question. Could this mean Google services on Windows Phone? Um, mm. then an intriguing possibility. We don't know. Uber settled a class action lawsuit in California and another one in Massachusetts, both claiming the company misclassified drivers as independent contractors. Under the terms of the settlement, Uber will pay drivers $84 million, not each, just split up yes. <laughs> among all the drivers. Uh, and an additional $16 million will be split up when and if the company goes public. Uber will also provide drivers more information about their ratings. Uh, for the first time, Uber will publish a policy on how drivers can be deactivated and give them more insight into that, uh, making it only deactivating for sufficient causes rather than at will, which it has been up till now. Uh, an appeals process will be put in place. Hearings will be uh, including other drivers, and you can then appeal to arbitration if you don't like the decision there. Uber will also facilitate and recognize a driver association. Now, it's not an official union, but it will do a lot of the things that a union would do. Drivers can now put signs in their cars, too, stating, quote, tips are not included, they are not required but they would be appreciated. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how they weren't allowed to say that before. So a lot of wins for drivers, but the key that we're going to talk about, Shannon, is this does not change the question of whether drivers are should legally be considered independent contractors or employees. Yeah, exactly. And I, I do have a lot of thoughts on that as well as my own personal opinions being freelancer myself, uh, but we'll definitely discuss it more. Windows released a new preview of the anniversary edition of Windows 10 uh, that now includes Windows Ink Workspace. Uh, a lot of people are looking forward to this, especially if they're using tablets and touchscreens and styluses. You can now create sticky notes, use a sketch pad or sketch anything on the screen, customize your pen buttons and more. Uh, Cortana integration shown at build is not yet included with Ink Space, though Cortana does now work on the lock screen. Your app list now shows right when you open the start menu. You don't need to use the hamburger menu to see folders in tablet mode anymore. You can also toggle to a full screen app list view, very helpful if you're in tablet mode. And you can set the tablet bar to auto hide in tablet mode. A lot of tablet friendly features coming back, sort of recorrecting as they figure out how to balance those two workspaces. A lot more stuff in this preview update. Napier Lopez at the Next Web has a great summary of it all. We'll have that link in the show notes as well. I have a uh, artist friend who was super excited to hear about this, and she can't wait to check out the preview of the uh, anniversary edition and be able to do some art on her own tablet. Uh, personally, though, I just switched to Ubuntu, so I'm not super excited about it myself. <laughs> yeah, the new LTS came out yesterday, and, and you're running that right now to to do this very show. It, and so far, other than the normal, like, hey, it's you know, new new environment, new operating system, things going well. Yeah, there's a few driver issues, but so far I've been able to get everything working. It's just, you know, reinstalling and finding the compatible drivers and what have you, but so far so good. It's it's the always the new moving into an operating system. Exactly. And people. of course That's Linux good. is always going to give you a little bit of a headache and you might have to figure out some new terminal commands that you've never learned before, but hey, that's one of the parts of educating yourself with a new operating system. Absolutely. And it's looking good. Yeah. Uh, knock, knock on wood. Uh, <laughs> Videogamer.com noted this morning that Amazon customers were saying, hey, uh, try to buy the PS4 versions of GTA V, Rainbow Six Siege, and Assassin's Creed, or maybe the PS4 and Xbox One versions of FIFA 16 and Far Cry Primal Battlefield Hardline, 
and they say I have to have an Amazon Prime account to buy them, at least if I want to buy them directly from Amazon. Uh, the games were sometimes available from third-party sellers. Amazon told VideoGamer.com that it does offer exclusives to Amazon Prime members and then subsequently lifted the exclusives, and now they're available for everybody to buy again. A weird morning there. Very weird morning. I actually tested this on my own machine, and even though they say that the 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 subscription basically cutoff was turned off, I still had that happen when I was logged out of my Prime account. And I deleted cookies and everything, so I wasn't sure why I was still having that issue. It was on GTA 5, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a weird thing. And I was not aware, I guess, that Amazon did a lot of this where they say, oh, this purchase is only for Prime members, uh, probably because I'm a Prime member and I'm always logged in. But that is a very odd thing to say, no, we don't want your money for older game titles. So I'm curious if we'll find out more about whether this was just a mistake or whether so. this was a promotion that went wrong and they decided to yank it when everybody got upset. Um, very, very interesting to see. <laughs> I mean, because I understand special events like, oh, pre-order this or limited release. And if you're a Prime member, you get it. That that would make sense. They did sense, that with but, their own Amazon products. They did yeah, that with the Echo. With the Echo, right. I mean, that, that makes perfect sense. But GTA 5, I mean, that's been out for a while. It's kind of random. Snapchat has ended the practice of being able to pay 99 cents for more than one replay of a message, uh, which... Sometimes I accidentally don't have the volume up and I use the free replay. And if I don't get it right the second time, I'm tempted to pay the 99 cents, but I never have. And maybe that's why they're ending that practice. Now you got one chance and that's it to replay. However, as they take away, they give us, uh, Snapchat has added the ability to face swap with photos from your camera roll. Uh, this new lens, which is what they call it when you long touch on your face and you're able to turn yourself into a dog and stuff, uh, will search your camera roll with your permission for faces that will work with it automatically. And it just shows them up in a nice little row. Like here's all the faces you could even, if you have pictures of yourself, face swap with yourself. This is so weird. <laughs> I just downloaded Snapchat like yesterday and I don't know. I've how been enjoying your snaps actually. It's good to see you. All. Thanks. Yeah. Cat videos and more cats. And... Your cat was impressive how it opened the cabinet. Oh yeah, she's really smart when she does that. She's not necessarily smart the rest of her life, but she's good with cabinets. <laughs> That's clever, yeah. yeah. Um, the whole face swapping thing kind of freaks me out. It's pretty freaky, yeah. Although yeah. I did run across the the pay system where you have to pay 99 cents because I wanted to, I, I, I didn't understand that you could only replay something once. Yeah. And I was like, what the heck? I don't want to pay 99 cents just to watch a, you know, well, 10 now, second video. Well, now you can't pay 99 cents anymore, well, so good. that's over. You missed that boat. <laughs> Uh, Facebook announced that more than 1 million people now use Tor to access Facebook, or at least 1 million people did this month. It's the first time they've passed the 1 million mark. Facebook launched a dot .onion version of the site back in October 2014 so that folks using Tor could access it for whatever privacy or security reason they wanted to. Facebook also began supporting the Android or bot proxy this year. Uh, it, it's interesting that, you know, I think a lot of people wondered if this was just a PR move and how much use it would get. It's getting a lot of use. It's getting a ton of use, but I say props to them because it's great to see more people valuing their own security and privacy. And while, of course, with Tor, you have to think about, okay, who's running those exit nodes? Am I actually being protected as much as I think I am? So don't, like, share your bank credentials over it. But it's it's fine for Facebook usage as long as you're, you're not sharing things like uh, maybe activism in a place where you might necessarily be killed for that kind of thing. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a fair point whatever you post on Facebook is still public, right? right? Tor doesn't protect you. If you say, I'm at the cafe at, the, at this intersection, people exactly. could, could see that. So, uh, but, it, but it will unblock Facebook in places where it might be blocked. And, and if you're protecting your identity with other ways and with what you post, then it will keep, it'll have a chance anyway, a good chance of keeping that IP address safe. BizTech Africa reports Kenya's high court judge Mumbi Ngugi ruled a provision in the Kenya Information and Communications Act, or Kika, uh, about the misuse of licensed telecommunications devices is unconstitutional. This had been used to crack down on bloggers and social media users who claimed uh, they were just trying to stop critics by saying, oh, you posted something we didn't like using a telecommunications device. We're going to prosecute you. In fact, 15 people were prosecuted under the act between January and March this year year. Justice Ngugi wrote that the provision was too broad and libel law already performed the function of protecting reputations and therefore it was not necessary and therefore struck it down. 
Yay! So this is a win for bloggers. Yeah, win for social media uh, posters Great. and bloggers, whistleblowers of, of all kinds. Uh, the Sydney Morning Herald, Adam Turner, points out that Opera's new built-in VPN, it does have a vulnerability. I can't remember, I think, who was asking about this yesterday in the chat room. Uh, it's got a very common vulnerability, the WebRTC flaw that leaks your real IP address. Now, Turner notes the Opera WebRTC leak prevent plugin can solve the problem, but only if you go in and change the default settings to stop WebRTC from using non-proxied UDP. So, like Annie points out, not a lot of people are going to know that and going to go to this length to do that. Uh, the built-in VPN, as you remember, is part of the developer release uh, that came out yesterday. So, you know, it, it is an alpha. It is meant to find bugs, and this is a bug that has been pointed out, so hopefully Opera fixes it. I completely agree with you. Open uh, our, uh, W... <laughs> what is it called? Open uh, Web RTC. That's Web RTC, that vulnerability. It's been around for a long time. Uh, it's been a problem for quite a few different services in the past. So this doesn't come as a surprise to me necessarily. Sure. Uh, I do hope they fix it before the full release, but I am remaining skeptical about a free VPN. Yeah, and, and you always should. I think Opera's providing it as an extra service. Uh, and you should it should be audited and vulnerabilities should be brought out like this uh, this is the system at work right here yeah. and you should uh, until you're a hundred percent certain not use it for anything critical right yes completely agree uh hey thanks to pc guy 88 franz games motang sp sheridan t glass 1976 flying spatula and more of you great folks who submitted things we used from our subreddit or even things we didn't use uh submit your stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and that is a look at the headlines Let's talk a little bit more about the, this, these Uber class action lawsuits. Uh, things aren't over yet. They settled these two, but as I mentioned, it does not determine the law about whether drivers should or should not be considered independent contractors. Similar lawsuits are still active in Florida, Arizona, and Pennsylvania. And there is a lawsuit, not a class action suit, but a lawsuit uh, revolving around Barbara Ann Berwick, an Uber driver, who the California Labor Commission declared should be classed as an employee Uber is appealing that decision, but that could actually decide the law on the situation. And essentially it comes down, Shannon, to the idea of you don't get to determine whether you take rides or not. Uber was punishing you if you didn't accept rides. So Uber has changed that process and said, okay, we're not going to deactivate you if you, de if you decline rides. We'll just log you out of the system if you decline a certain amount of rides. Uh, essentially trying to distance themselves from that part of the argument. Uh, they also don't get to negotiate their price. Uh, the price is what Uber says it is. Whether it's surge pricing or whether it's not, uh, you have to take the price. And usually an independent contractor gets to negotiate on their price. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the ledger, you don't have to be an Uber driver. You can you can leave whenever you want. You can go work for Lyft. You can work for Lyft and Uber at the same time. There's, there's all kinds of freedoms that independent contractors do have that employees don't have. So as, like you said at the beginning of the show, as someone who freelances, where do you think of all of this? Well, it's kind of weird for Uber drivers. I almost feel like they fall in this middle ground between being a normal employee and a independent contractor. It's almost as if they're setting a new a new precedent for future businesses because this one is so very different and this whole entire case has been so huge and so majorly publicized. Uh, the fact that you can, you know, you can set your own time, you can choose when you decide to work, you can go wherever you want uh, with Uber is great for independent contractors contracting, especially since they're, you know, using their own cars, they're able to expense their mileage, they can do all of those kind of things for the IRS and get decent money back in taxes. On the other hand, though, you do run into this issue where they can't negotiate their prices. So if you have somebody that depends on this income from Uber, say they don't have a second job, maybe they don't work for Lyft for the other few days of the week that their kids are in school or whatever it might be, they have to depend on Uber setting these prices for them. And if Uber, for some mysterious reason, just cuts them off, you know, what are they going to do? They're kind of screwed in that case. Uh, so I think this entire case is very important. It's not done yet. It's only been settled. It hasn't been completely decided, especially since there's so many other cases that are currently happening in so many different states. So I'm, I'm very curious how this is going to develop further because the the story's not done, and I feel like there's still a fight that's going to be happening between Uber and, and the drivers, especially for the drivers. Yeah, and 
I think there are a lot of good arguments why these kinds of drivers should be considered independent contractors. At yeah. the same time, I think Uber is trying to maintain as much control as they can over them in order to get the benefits of having employees without treating them like employees and not have to provide work, work worker compensation, health insurance. Yeah, you know. I, can, I can understand it from a business perspective, and this is not to say that I'm on one side or another, but from running a business, I understand that you have to pay additional taxes, and in, as an employer, you have to pay additionals into like Social Security and stuff like that. You have to give them benefits, and it's very, very expensive for a company to have so many employees to the point that it would end up raising prices for the consumers, for the people that are using these, these cars to get them around to different places. Yes. So it would end up boosting up prices. It would end up like maybe decreasing Uber's usability in a, in certain cities. Maybe Lyft would end up with a much higher market share. We don't necessarily know, but when you come down to the business perspective of it, I, I get why Uber is deciding to fight this as much as they are. However, I really understand the case for the drivers too, especially like when they bring in the tips, for example. Yeah, let's talk about that because I think a lot of us were under the impression that Uber was this thing that you didn't have to tip because it was already included in the price. Fact of the matter is, no, it was not included in the price. Uh, in fact, the drivers could accept tips, but they had to say they couldn't. The previous Uber policy before the settlement, and, and I suppose still the policy outside of Massachusetts and California, is that if a client offers a tip, please remind them that tipping is not necessary with Uber. Uh, in fact, the reason Uber says that is because they want to keep it cashless. You shouldn't have to carry cash when you take an Uber. That's one of the advantages. New riders may not know about the tipping policy and could feel cheated if they later learn the tipping was not required. However, if the rider still insists, you should accept the tip. You earned it. That's that's the policy. That's what the policy was. Basically, it's kind like of a weird policy. It was well. Uh, me and Gary Bronze, I remember back in eighth grade, uh, both determined that our families had taught us if someone wants to give you something, you turn it down once. But if they insist, you take it. And apparently Uber was making that their official policy. <laughs> That's kind of the same thing I was taught at, at a young age. And I used to work in restaurants. So it's very customary for me to give people a tip for good service. You know, 15, 20, sometimes even 25% if I have excellent service. So one of the first times that I got in an Uber, I was straight up with them. I was like, I've never used this before. Do you get tips in the app? And the guy that was driving me said, no, but it's not necessary, which is like a direct quote from their policy, yes. basically. I must tell so, them it is not necessary or I will be in trouble. <laughs> now uh, I fully understand why I said that, but I feel kind of bad because I don't think that I had tipped him because I was like, oh, it's not necessary. Like, they must get... Uh, uh, an additional, or maybe maybe the reason why Uber is a little bit more expensive at the time is because you know they get more money for that, so they're they're not necessarily minimum wage. Well, turns yeah. out Uber drivers don't make a lot of money unless it's during surge pricing times. Yeah, exactly. And so here's the thing: tip your Uber driver. Uh, it's a pain, or use Lyft. You know why? Because Lyft actually lets you tip the driver in the app. They makes do. no bones about it. It's not awkward. It says, hey, you don't have to tip, but you can. And if you want to, here's how you do it. Just add it. And Lyft even lets you add it after you finish paying. If you forget and you're like, oh, I wanted to give that guy a couple bucks. He was so good. You go into the Lyft app, you can add it after the fact. Lyft does that right. I uh, love Uber, how they do it. It's so yeah. easy in Lyft, but Uber makes it a little bit more complicated, especially if you're very new if you, and you've never used the app before. Well, getting back to the the independent contractor, and then this is why tipping is such a deal for the Uber drivers is they're like, hey, we're we're turning down an income that we could get. Uh, I and, and personally, I love not having to deal with the weird tipping universe that the United States has when I when I go abroad. And so I liked the idea that I didn't have to do it. But if you make it easy in the app, uh, then I won't feel weird. And this is enough to make me want to use Lyft so that I just don't have to deal with that question. Mm -hmm. But I do think in the end. What this says is that people like Uber drivers and probably a lot of other, uh, you know, Postmates delivery and, and, and other class of people like this 
are not independent contractors. They are not able to negotiate a contract. When I'm an independent contractor with Tech Republic for the five apps videos, I can say, oh, hey, you know what? This clause in the contract, I need you to change that. I don't think Uber right. drivers have that leverage. Uh, so they're not fully independent contractors, but they're also not fully employees. Uh, and I think one thing people may not understand that Shannon alluded to earlier is if you employ someone full time, you don't only have to take the money out of their their check for Social Security and for taxes. You have to pay extra on top of that. It's called the payroll tax. So the more you pay someone, the more expensive they get beyond just what you're paying them. Having full time employees raises your tax level. You have to pay tax to employees people in the United States. I didn't realize that till I became someone who was running an LLC and yep. I get why it's there, but there is an avoidance uh, on companies to want to do this unless they have to. And there are definitely freedoms that Uber drivers have and that Postmates delivery people have that a full-time employee wouldn't normally have as far as just being able to decide when you're going to work. An Uber driver doesn't have to check in a certain amount of hours. There might be a minimum that they have to drive, but they can decide to work more or less based on their schedule. And I think there should be a new class that protects these workers, gives them leverage, uh, but at the same time, doesn't actually force them to be considered full-time employees when they're not. It's it's 2016, and given that we have so many on-demand companies and businesses that allow people to just do what they're good at, do a service that they feel like they are an expert at, it feels like it's time to bring in some kind of new genre for workers. And I wonder if uh, a union could negotiate that sort of thing. It, it, it yeah. might require legislation, but I'm very curious about this driver's association. We mentioned it in the headline. It is not a union, but it will act like a union. It will be facilitated by Uber, but will not be controlled by Uber. It will be controlled by the drivers and will sit in the quarterly meetings and give the drivers a voice. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of reasons why maybe it should be a union if it's going to act like a union, uh, because there's a lot of union intimidation that can happen if you're not protected uh, by the laws that apply specifically to unions. But it's an interesting settlement that the lawyers on behalf of the class were, be able, were able to wrangle out of Uber. And I'm curious whether it's just going to end up falling flat because Uber can crush it because Uber is funding it or whether it will actually make a difference. I hope it makes a difference, especially for the drivers, but yeah, exactly. Just like you said, you we don't necessarily know how Uber is going to react to this new uh, uh, union that their drivers are being able to create now, because it is, you know, it's under Uber's, uh, it's under their their supervision, basically. Yeah, I mean, Uber is, what did you see? So let me find the, Uber is uh, agreeing to facilitate and recognize the association. Right. But it could then become independent of Uber. And actually, I'm curious if they could join the driver's union. Uh, there is a driver's union for taxi drivers that already exists. Uh, I'm sure Uber wouldn't like that. The taxi much. drivers pretty pretty much wouldn't like that either. Well, I don't know. <laughs> At least uh, not if, the ones in Vegas. <laughs> if the taxi driver, they wouldn't like what? Joining a union or joining the having Uber drivers? The taxi drivers probably wouldn't like, want to have Uber or Lyft drivers join them in some kind of union. I don't, yeah, I wonder. Uh, I could see why you'd say that because they're not real happy that they exist at all. But if they get past the point of, if, if they get to acceptance and like, well, they're not going away, I'd rather have them on our side, yeah. uh, you know, negotiating for, for a fairer marketplace. And a lot of those taxi drivers are becoming Uber and Lyft drivers right, as the that's demand true. for taxi goes down. LA Times had an article about that here. Um, I don't know. It's a, uh, it's very interesting. And I really do think, and I, and I know I haven't formed this opinion very well here, but I do think there is a third class of worker that needs protection, but needs different protection than a full-time employee. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I agree with you. Hmm. So I mean, we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep thinking on that. It's, it's, it's something that is arising out of here where you need to, you need to give an employee the flexibility that comes from being this kind of independent worker, but without, the downside of not getting paid very well and not being protected from abuse. Now there is part time, but even then they have to pay for that employee uh, status. Yeah. And maybe that's, maybe there is something that can be done to the part time worker classification tweaked yeah. to apply to this. I don't know. 
Uh, let's get to our pick of the day. Harrison recommends something called ARC Backup. It's been recommended by Steve Gibson before, as a matter of fact. It's ARQ at ARQbackup.com. Uh, he says, Harrison says, they just did a version 5 update. It's now on OS X and Windows. Works like Time Machine, does pre-internet encryption. So your stuff gets encrypted before it hits the network. That's important. And with version 5, it's multi-threaded, significantly faster. Uh, it backs up to local or cloud provider of your choice. You pay for the service to work for the software, but then you have to provide your own uh, storage. So if you already have Dropbox, maybe you use that. Maybe you got some free OneDrive, although the amount's going down. Don't forget that. Uh, or maybe you just pay for, for cheap storage on Amazon S3. You decide, kind of like Jungle Disk used to be. You tell it where to go. Uh, Harrison says, I chose Amazon Cloud Drive, cheap and unlimited. Also with this update, they changed the license model from per machine to per user. So now I can push it to all my machines. I had this originally on just my home file server, but with the license change, I've now installed it on my MacBook Pro. I was able to push up Amazon Cloud Drive as my backup 400 gigabytes overnight, which on my server months ago took almost a month. Just wanted to pass this along as a great backup utility and well worth the update. That's cool. I mean, $50 one-time fee, that's not bad for their, their one-time storage choice. Yeah, you're just paying for the software and then basically uh, it is software that runs and puts your data wherever you want it to. You're in control of it. Mm -hmm. I like that. Uh, I, I, I use, uh, it sounds similar to crash plan. I, believe. I was going to say, I use crash plan. I was blanket on the name, which, which has a different model for how you pay for it. You can, you can choose them as the destination of your storage, but you can also use crash plan with a one-time fee the same way. So, right. Yeah. ARQbackup.com. Thank you, Harrison. Send your picks to us, folks. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And you can find more picks, including this one at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Ah, uh, yes. So yesterday we mentioned that uh, the communications, or I'm sorry, the transportation minister in the UK had said that they weren't sure what hit, if anything, that airplane landing at Heathrow and remarked it might have been a plastic bag or something. Uh, of course, that's still all over the headlines this morning. Joe the pilot did not disappoint, uh, sent in a note where he was sort of mocking the, the uh, quadcopter flyers saying, welcome to the club of getting blamed for something that's not your fault. Uh, he's like, Dunkin' Donuts out of donuts at the airplane? Blame the pilot. I guess I guess he's experienced this before. Uh, but he also points out the little I read made it sound like the BA Flight 727 struck what appeared to be a UAV at 1,700 feet, which means the aircraft was probably just inside or just outside the final approach fix and probably traveling at 130 to 180 knots depending on the aircraft weight and ATC clearance. It was reported that no damage was found and the mechanics signed off the aircraft. That leads me to believe that if anything impacted the airplane, it was very light, but more likely nothing hit the airplane. It was, uh, all we need is the maintenance log from the aircraft describing the open write-up, possibly UAV strike at 1700 feet at X knots to nose area, and the corrective action box on the other half of the page by station maintenance saying impact area was not found. Aircraft inspected in accordance with IAW Airbus log, blah, 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 and area of damage inside safe perimeters or no damage noted. Follow up with an exhaustive search under the area of impact by some law enforcement group and have the CAA's Incident Investigation Board follow up with a summary of findings. My God, though, by the time we have factual answers, people might already have moved on and forgotten about this incident. The horror. <laughs> Uh, and then he points out, he's like, look, I've struck a few birds in a few types of airplanes and they always leave marks. Mm. Uh, he goes on to say, it's possible a UAV might be light enough that it doesn't leave a mark, uh, but he thinks it probably would. Uh, he's like, usually if something actually strikes you, you know it. Given it was that high up, I feel like a smaller UAV wouldn't have been the issue because those don't have very good ranges. <laughs> yeah, and he, sa he said it's, he's like, if you hear, if a bird strikes you, you hear a thump, uh, but sometimes oh, yeah. you, something will strike and you won't hear it at all. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to say, but Joe, man, thanks for uh, sharing the insight as always appreciated. Uh, text Jeb wrote in and said, I know the story was about Prince and his relation to the internet, and I shouldn't be one of the stupid trolls, but you did mention several artists who recently passed. And we mentioned like David Bowie, for instance, in other words, you didn't mention the thing I care about. And yeah, I know it's vain, but damn it. I have to say it. Why the run on sentence Merle 
you left out Merle. Like many traditional country artists, Merle turned to the internet where it's really become a haven for music that doesn't get terrestrial radio play. Guys like Stoney Lore and Ray Scott are selling more records and tickets now than they did when they had big recording contracts in the late 2000s. And Merle Haggard was embracing that culture, not unlike Johnny Cash towards the end. Again, I know that was not the story and most of your audience doesn't share my musical affinities, but a country boy can't let it go. Aww. End of rant. Oh, that's awesome. It's I, so oh, nicely girl. written, too. Thank you, uh, Text Jeb, for, for writing it that way. Uh, because, yeah, man, I, I saw Merle Haggard at the Bond County Fairgrounds, my friend, oh, wow. like back in the 80s. So I, I, I feel you. And, uh, yeah, it, it, he's right. It's one of those things where, you know, you're always going to leave out something from someone. But I, I wanted to give Merle his due. Mm -hmm. Finally... Uh, we, we speculated on the idea of uh, Apple getting rid of ports on the iPhone uh, in response to Le Echo getting rid of the headphone jack on their Android phone. Uh, Mike writes, but even if you have a good set of devices that can play back videos perfectly well, there's one area where Bluetooth audio fails, gaming. A good device can read ahead on the audio stream when playing video and transmit the data early so you hear it in sync with the video. This is impossible to do with games since many sounds are directly linked to the actions you make. So there's generally always going to be a half second delay or more with those sounds while gaming. Uh, you may hear Mario's jump sound when he's at the ape of the jump about to come down. This makes gameplay very disorienting and difficult. Now, I've played game with my Bluetooth headsets, but I don't know if I've played anything that the sound syncing up was integral to, and I haven't really noticed it that much. Uh, but I could see if you're like a serious gamer, that could be an issue. Toy Driver on Twitter points out that he has uh, desktop and windshield display mounts for his Note 5 with wireless charging built in and loves it. So he thinks wireless charging is ready. Uh, he doesn't think we have to wait for that. And uh, Samsung does have fast wireless charging. I've forgotten about that when we were talking yesterday. And finally, Scorebook SW uh, rightly reminds us that some airlines don't allow Bluetooth devices on flights, uh, sometimes during takeoff and landing, though the US FAA has cleared Bluetooth for use during all phases of the flight. Depends on the airline you're flying. So there you go. Would you want to use a phone that didn't have any ports, Shannon? No. Absolutely not. I like having the ability to do hacks. <laughs> you can still hack Android it. <laughs> you can still hack it wirelessly, right? Yeah, well, you can, definitely. But there are some really cool hardware hacks that you can do with Android phones, but you, you are required to have a micro USB, for example, mm -hmm. to be able to institute those. Yeah. Well, there you go. Uh, thanks uh, for all the thoughts, everybody. Uh, thank you, Shannon. I uh, was curious if you used sudo to make Darren get you a sandwich. He said so in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, pseudo taxu so that he always does it, and I don't have to mention it every single time. Well done. But yes. <laughs> uh, I doesn't I just RM tech RF that? Uh, oh, dear, yeah, be careful. You'll have no more Darren. Uh, hey, uh, tech thing and hack five and and all the things that you do. What what? How do folks find more of Shannon? Uh, the easiest place is on Twitter. I'm at snubs, S-N-U-B-S. Otherwise, you can check out hak5.org, where we just finished up our built of a really cool sub 250 gram drone. Uh, we took it out and did some test flights, and we did a whole episode about practicing if you're very new to, to drones yourself, so you can learn how to get really proficient with it. And then on Tech Thing, we've been reviewing some really cool products lately, and Tech Thing is over at tekthing.com, and that's a very consumer based oriented review show. Uh, so we do a lot of how to's, we answer, answer viewer questions. It's really fun to get down into the nitty gritty of consumer tech. Yeah, with the awesome Patrick Norton. Yes, with Patrick Norton him. and Darren Kitchen on Hack5. Check it out, folks, hak5.org. Uh, big thanks to everyone who supports the show. Uh, like I say every time, we could not do it without you. Literally, there is no other funding that the show gets, and you make it possible. Dailytechnewsshow.com slash support uh, to help us keep going. We're on our way to the day six goal. Uh, we're more than halfway there, and so since we've reached the halfway point every other week, Peter Wells is doing a Sunday episode from Australia. What do you have in store for us this week, Peter? 
G'day Tom and listeners, this is Peter Wells. I will be taking over the hot seat one more time this Sunday for the Daily Tech News Show Day 6. Um, my guest this week is Mr Patrick Beja and we will, we will be discussing the fact that Tinder uses Australia uh, to do some of its beta testing of its app, which I thought was pretty fascinating. I don't know what else we'll talk about. Depends what happens between now and Sunday. Until then, have a fantastic weekend and I'll speak to you Sunday. Thanks Peter. And that'll show up just in your regular feed uh, with Patrick Beja. So it'll, it'll feel like a normal day, even more so. I'm um, looking forward to that. Uh, the House of Lords in the UK is investigating anti-competitive practices in online travel booking, so stay tuned on the audio version of the show for the latest episode of Tech and Travel from Chris the Amateur Traveler, who has some numbers that indicate why that might be happening. And of course, if you're watching the video and you support the show on Patreon, you can get that episode in the treasure chest. Just look for Tech and Travel Episode 9. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can give us a call, 5125-9-DAILY. That's 5932 Catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern at alphageekradio.com and diamondclub.tv. And visit our website at dailytechnewsshow.com. Peter Wells on Sunday and back on Monday with Veronica Belmont. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs) Great show. Yay! Good stuff. Yeah, guys, nominate us for the, uh, uh, what are they called? Podcast awards. Night a pack. Pudo, right dot here. Com. Oh, yeah, sure. Buster? Yeah, cool. thanks. Oh, yeah, there it is. Hack 5 technology. Yay. I am not allowed to win that. Uh, Daily Tech News Show is not. So I cannot think of a better choice to take the reins. Thanks, guys. And then vote for cord killers and current geek. <laughs> oh wow, my battery is low. <laughs> I guess I should charge that. Oh, did you not? Were you not plugged in? No. <laughs> oh man, I'm so it's paranoid. Okay. I never do I that. Have half an hour left. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> is Roger still in here? Going. Oh yeah, he's here. So I should check that out. All right, show titles. Yeah. Uh, Amazon, Amazon playing games. Tip your Uber driver. Just the tips. Uh, agree to not disagree. Opera's VPN isn't. Google Soft. China chins the Apple movies and books. Hmm. Just Might be a little too them. clever. Uh, <laughs> Apple closes the books on China. Darren delivers. Amazon's exclusive or Amazon's unexclusive exclusive. Mm, nothing here jumps out at me. Drivers win Uber cent- settlement. That's pre- what you. What is that? A burger? It's a. What is it's, it? Um, it's like a faux turkey sandwich. It's not actually turkey. I don't know. It's what it is. It's a tofurkey. Is it soy based? Yeah, I think so. I'll find out. But it's it's yummy. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's because you have to add a lot. Of, I won't go into it. Um, <laughs> don't RMRF him. Uh, <laughs> No, I've, I've had plenty of tofurkey. Plenty. Okay. Um, I like tip your Uber driver. Tip your Uber driver. That's a good one. Straight to the point. You got any thoughts on the matter, Ms. Morse? Yeah, I like tip your Uber driver so far. Were there any more? Well, there was drivers win Uber settlement. Union plan versus Uber man. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I like the first one. Tip but, your Uber drivers. Yeah. Try the veal. Eat more bacon. Oh, I, I got to cut back on red meats. I'm at the age where it's just not good for my diet, I think. I didn't Aww. eat red meat a lot uh, through most of my life. I eat a lot more now that I'm married to Eileen, and it's fine. Maybe it's because I didn't eat as much before. I eat less now, now that I'm not now working with Patrick. Tiling. No, it's because I don't work with Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly. I mean, Shannon, more. do you find yourself eating more red meat now that you work with Patrick? No. I usually don't have much meat for lunch. I just eat meat for dinner. Mm. See, I used to never buy meat, and I wouldn't always order something. I'd, I'd order fish and stuff. I wasn't vegetarian. Yeah. Uh, I was vegetarian for a couple of years, but not for very long. Um, but yeah, Eileen's like, oh no, we, we must have meat. 
a lot of meat. I'm I'm a big fan of salmon and fried chicken. I love salmon. Mm. I love fried chicken too. No, I'm the fried only. I must be the only person because I really don't like salmon. I don't oh, know really? why. It's something about the meat oil, whatever. It just yeah. bothers me. You don't uh, have the salmon gene. I probably don't. I like uh, I like tuna. Like I like tuna's mm-hmm. amazing. I like tuna. I like mild t- like bottom feeders like catfish or halibut. Oh, I love uh, I love oily fish like uh, uh, mackerel and stuff. Oh god, I can't stand that I stuff. Like all of them. I'm so excited to have actually like all the fish. Japan. Yeah. Oh my gosh, when do you go? The 13th. 13th. Yay! Very exciting. Gonna have a meetup. Yay! Hopefully. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna be there. Yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be people there. There'll be yeah, a few. You're gonna, you're gonna get a good turnout. It's gonna be so much fun. Oh yeah, I'm jealous. I want to go to Japan too. Can't wait to eat all the sushi. But see, Eileen wants to go to Korea. Ooh. So Never I might not. Get you know, to there's go to two Japan. Koreas. There's not just one. Yeah, which one should we go to? Do you, think? <laughs> you know, I noticed that. <laughs> According sure to John Oliver, to. North Korea was voted the top Korea in North Korea magazine. Yeah. Uh, well, and the <laughs> northern parts of places are often considered the more developed areas. Yes. Um, I have a layover <laughs> in Seoul. Oh, you do? You connect through Seoul? Yeah. Eileen just wants to go to Korea so she can buy Korean beauty products. I don't know <laughs> if they're cheaper over there, though. No, but they have stuff she can't get over oh. here. Oh I'm sure God. you can order online and have them ship it to her. I know. Ethan Kane, uh, Ethan Kane in the chat room is in Korea, and he very kindly has said he will send us anything we want, but Eileen just hasn't given me a list. Uh, but I have a feeling we won't get there before he leaves because he's leaving pretty soon. No, you'll like it. You'll like it. It's it's it's. Uh, when I first got there, it it was at both Talk about sort Japan, of, right? Japan it was both familiar and uh, different at the same time for me. Really? Wow. Well, one is I don't stick out, right? Like I really <laughs> don't stick out, which is weird because even even Chinese university students who study there kind of stick out. I don't stick out. I'm gonna stick out. My hair's oh, gonna yeah. be terrible. I bet I'll stick out. Oh, <laughs> you would. <laughs> you probably hit your head on everything. Who is the giant man? <laughs> well, you know, the, the one thing I did realize is um, their body type uh, leans, uh, no uh, pun intended, <laughs> to, for at least for men towards scrawny. Oh, like yeah. I could find clothes that fit, but they're they're like for my frame, like the width of my chest is wider, I guess, by half than the average yeah, Japanese guy by height. So I wear, if I get a jacket or anything, like the coat goes down to my knees because it's like designed <laughs> for like, you know, a guy who's like 6'4", who just eats rice and, you know, shoots and fish. Shoots? <laughs> Bamboo shoots. Oh, oh. <laughs> I thought you meant like goes to the gun range. I'm like, oh, that no. doesn't seem very Japanese. No bamboo shoots. <laughs> Oh, the one thing I remember about living there, not living there, but when my girlfriend was living there, um, everything comes in very small sizes because their fridges are tiny. Like, oh. And so you can't get a lot in there. So no, people tend that. to get out a lot. Yeah. So I'm sure the restaurants will be good. Most of them are. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be a mixed bag depending on what you, what you want to get, though. Did you, have, you, uh, re, have you asked Patrick Beja to give you recommendations? Oh, yeah. We're going to go to a gyoza restaurant together. Oh, sweet. That's awesome. Double date. What? <laughs> I always find that kind of weird because all, all I think is, oh, let's go to a pot sticker restaurant. It's like, okay. I'm totally okay with that. There have been multiple times that I've just eaten gyoza for dinner, and it's so good. Let's have Probably gyoza terrible for me, for but dinner. I don't care. Dumplings in general, Chinese dumplings are generally pretty bad for you if you eat too many. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like my dad says, is like you know they're really high in fat and and oil. I mean they're designed that way because they were they were meant for travelers on the Silk meat, Road. They're meat fat, right? Yeah, they're not vegetable fat. So yeah, it's it's, not, it's not like great. you know pork or beef or oh yeah or what have you. So it's it's pretty rich because it was designed as like a handheld food. Like if you got a por- yeah, barbecue, keep you going pork, on the road, right? Yeah, especially when you're walking next to your camel carrying all your you know, <laughs> linen and stuff you're gonna hawk in the Middle East. Um, and so like it was, you know, it wasn't meant to be eaten. Like some people eat it every day. It's like, are you kidding? Like, uh, you, you might want to down a thing of 
Metamucil. I'm sorry. Are you on? Are you walking next to your camel? I don't think so. Why are you eating that? <laughs> no, no. Are you gyoza shaming people, Roger? No, I oh, shame people shame. regardless of what they eat. <laughs> I'm proud it's... of my gyoza. <laughs> That's right. You should be. <laughs> oh, are you going to pick up Sailor Moon stuff? Oh my gosh, I'm spending like an entire day shopping Sailor Moon stuff. Are you buying a separate suitcase to bring back just all that stuff? Yeah. In fact, there's a Sailor Moon suitcase. I don't know if it'll be available when I go there, but there is a Sailor Moon suitcase that I want to buy, and then I'll they, just put all my Sailor Moon stuff in the Sailor Moon suitcase. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. There was a lot of stuff I wanted to get. I remember going to an old video game store, not old, but a used video game store. Ooh. It's like, whoa, they had a Sega Saturn for like 50 bucks like a bunch of games, and they're really cheap. I mean, they were granted they were all in Japanese, but it's like, like I have no way to take any of this back. Like my luggage was too small. Like I can't carry any of this stuff. I'm bringing just carry-ons. Yeah. Are you flying Japan Airlines? No, I'm flying a uh, United. It was cheaper by like six hundred bucks. Will it actually be a United plane though, or is it code shared with somebody? Um, the first one yeah. is United. The last one is United. The one to Korea is Singapore. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Actually, Eileen flew Singapore to the Philippines years ago, and it was great, but then I've heard it's not, like, it hasn't kept pace. It's not oh. bad, but, oh. like, it used to be super, super nice, and now it's normal nice. I'm just planning to, like, drink a whole bottle of wine and then get on the plane and pass out the whole time. <laughs> yeah. All First right. time I flew to London, I just was like, keep the drinks coming. Yep. <laughs> I can sleep on a plane. The problem is I wake up. And I remember yeah. waking when I was flying to Australia, I woke up, and I was like, oh, seven hours. Man, there's so much time passed by. There's going to be a breeze. It's like, wait a minute, there's six hours left? Oh, and I was wow. Like, and then I had to watch a bunch of um, – there's a Cana French Canadian Quebec comedy show, Just for Laughs or something. It's like Alan Funt's Candid Camera where they do like oh. – they mess with people in the public doing – and I, I sat there and I had to watch an hour of that, and I was like, I just want to get off this plane. Get me off this plane. <laughs> My only saving grace was the um, the doctor and the general from Stargate One were four rows ahead of me. I guess they what? were flying out to a convention or something. Awesome. I remember her. I remember overhearing her. It's like I really want a carton of cigarettes. I really want a carton of cigarettes. <laughs> Who said that? The, the the actress that played the doctor in uh, in Stargate One, the first doctor. The blonde one. Oh um, yeah, shoot. She, she Carter. Like, no, not not Carter. Um, no, the woman who played the doctor. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh wait, the, wasn't she a brunette? Yes, yeah. and she's okay, been in yeah. a lot of stuff. I really like her. Yeah. She's a good actress. She's awesome. So, because I noticed them at the uh, Janet Preston. She's no, one of the Terry ones. Terry Rothery, Terry Roth well, Rothery, done. Terry Rothery. I remember seeing them at the gate, and they were talking, you know, talking over their flight. It's like, oh, that's kind of cool. It's like wondering where they're headed. It's like, oh, same place I am. <laughs> Okie dokie. I am out of the post. Like I sat next to him. Yay. Um, thanks, everybody, for watching. You guys are the best. Have a lovely weekend, and we'll see you on the internet. <laughs>